Welcome back, everyone. I'm so happy to be here today with Lisa Lewis Miller. Lisa, welcome to the Sustainable Ambition Podcast. Thank you very much, Kathy. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm so excited for this conversation. So first, let me introduce you to Lisa. So Lisa is a career change expert, author, and the founder of Career Clarity, a company helping individuals step into the careers they've been dreaming of. She is someone who will believe in your potential career happiness as strongly as you do and help equip you with the ideas and resources to make it happen. She has done this and coached more than 500 individuals through career changes. Lisa's thought leadership has been featured in the Washington Post, U.S. News and World Report, Fast Company, and many other outlets. She also late last year released her book titled Career Clarity as well. And the book walks you through a simple approach to finding fulfilling work. Through the book, you'll learn an adaptive strategy for how to define success on your own terms, identify roles that fit your values, and transition into energizing work that lets you grow. And a fun fact about Lisa is that she used to be a part of an all-female barbershop a cappella group that qualified for international competition and was one of the top 40 quartets in the world in 2018. I think that's pretty amazing. <laughs> um, so Lisa's multi-talented for sure. And as much as I'm tempted, Lisa, because I really love acapella, um, but I will keep us focused on career clarity and not um, ask you to sing for us today. So um, <laughs> I appreciate that. I would have warmed up differently had I known. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, and I also realize you kind of need your group ideally with you, right? So <laughs> it, it is kind of a team sport. But um, and I, I would not be the right person to be partnering with you in that regard. <laughs> So instead, I'd love to start here. Um, I often hear people say, I don't know what I want around their career. And I'm sure you hear this as well. And you've provided the perfect offering and book to help people get career clarity. So when people are that confused or don't have the sense of what they want at all, where do you tell them to start? Well, Kathy, it's a great question because I think everybody listening can identify with feeling that way at some point or another throughout the course of their career progression and development. It can feel really easy to feel disconnected from who you are and what you want, to feel unclear on the pathways forward, to feel confused or scared or like you're swirling or you're adrift. And at the same time, there's an interesting paradox, which mm. is that you are the only person who can know what you want. So this tension between feeling like we don't know, but also being the only definitive source of information to answer this question is a really interesting place to be. And what I oftentimes see and what I found to be true with previous folks that I've worked with is that it's not usually factually true that we don't know what we want. It's more often the case that we feel like we're swirling and we feel like we're uncertain. And what we need is some kind of decision-making framework or some sort of way to organize what feels like chaos inside of our minds and hearts to get a clearer picture of what we want. Because when you ask somebody who says, I don't know what I want, if you ask them, well, what, what do you not want? <laughs> what do you want to get away from? What do you prefer to have out of your life? They can usually answer that question with a certain amount of, of clarity and with speed because our bodies create this really beautiful, interesting feedback loop where they give us somatic data points that tell us what we don't want. And I can imagine if you're listening to this and you think about the last time that there was something in your life that was a that was a heck no, that was a decision or a project or an experience that you just did not want to have anything to do with or that went south on you, even just recalling that memory to the forefront of your mind will create physiological reactions. You might notice your shoulders start to get tense and start to creep up towards your ears. 
you might notice tension and activation coming in through your arms and your hands. You might notice your breathing gets shallower or faster. You might notice almost a physical withdrawal as if you are being pulled backwards away from a situation. And you can notice almost a sensation of disgust or frustration or or an energetic change internally when you think about the things that you don't want. Now, insofar as we have this internal feedback loop that tells us the things that we don't want, we also have a feedback loop to help us know the things we want to lean into and the things that we do want in our careers and in our lives. So when somebody is coming to me with this question of, I don't know what I want, the very first place that I want to go with them is in recalibrating that internal sense of knowing, recalibrating that inner GPS, if you will, to remember what wanting feels like and being allowed to desire things feels like, remembering what excitement and enthusiasm feels like. Because once you remember how it feels in your body when you feel good and when something feels like a heck yes decision, the sense of energy, the sense of excitement, the sense that you just can't stop talking about the thing and you get even more animated, the the sense of warmth or even just like an energized sparkly energy coursing through your veins, that energy can start to make it clear about the things that you want. And Kathy, I'll also say that once you recalibrate that inner GPS and you have a better somatic understanding of the things that you want to lean towards and the things that excite you, the next thing that typically happens is that oftentimes it'll bubble up that you actually do know what you want, but it feels forbidden. It feels off limits. It's quitting your job. It's taking a sabbatical. It is changing careers. It is moving across the country. It is taking a three-week vacation. It's, it could be all sorts of things. And often what then pops up is this sense of, of, of being impossible. Oh, I could never do that. Oh, that isn't available to me. Oh, I don't have the financial runway to navigate something like that. So oftentimes, step one is giving yourself permission to to feel the data points and to understand what you need. Step two is giving yourself the permission that you are allowed to want what you want, even when it feels weird or counterculture or unexpected or that it is bucking traditional social norms about how a career or a life is supposed to look. Yeah, I love this advice and this counsel of like really getting into your body and tapping into your own knowing And as you're describing this, I was sensing both the importance of paying attention and listening to yourself. And I can also see people then, even before you went to the forbidden and impossible, I could see people potentially being resistant to it or what do you mean get into my body? I don't, it feels a little awkward. And then you went to like, even once you start to know that, you know, and now it starts to feel forbidden and potentially impossible. So do you have any tips for people that start to feel resistance through this process? How do you get them over that resistance and start to actually get them to open up to these possibilities? Mm, It's such a good question. And your use of the word resistance is really interesting because there, I think, are some times when we are very consciously resistant, and there are times that we are unconsciously resistant. So I'll give you an example. There are certain tracks of careers that have a, a breakneck pacing to them. I refer to these as careers where you are full of zooming, and not zoom like the video conferencing, but zoom like you are moving with some serious velocity You're zooming from one meeting to another meeting to replying to that urgent client email to hopping onto that call to forgetting to go to the bathroom or have lunch during the day to, oh my gosh, it's seven o'clock, I got to get home. And when you're in a career path that includes a lot of zooming, oftentimes that zooming creates the disconnect from your body, 
from your physiological bodily needs, like, hey, I need to stand up and stretch and go for a walk. I need to use the bathroom. I need to have a snack. I need to have more water. And that zooming can oftentimes create the the disconnect from your inner GPS. So sometimes the resistance can pop up because reconnecting in with your body and what your body's trying to tell you can ultimately feel very threatening to the zooming path you have put yourself on of, oh my gosh, what if I slow down? What if I pause? What if I take a minute? And then I can never get back up to this capacity again. What if by by taking a breath and an exhale, what if I sabotage my ability to grow in this space and in this career? So sometimes people will have this unconscious resistance to tapping back into what's going on on a somatic level because there's a big fear that they will never be able to recover, that it will be disastrous. So if somebody's listening and any of that's resonating with you, maybe take even just five minutes. See if you could give yourself permission to take a 15-minute break actually during the course of your workday. If you cannot make a 15-minute break happen at any point during your workday, this is probably you. And if you can't make a 15-minute break happen during the course of your workday, there are some questions we should be asking about, do you really have a a life that's worth, a life that feels good? A life that feels the way that you want it to. I mean, knowing that this is a sustainable ambition podcast, do you have a life that's feeling sustainable Mm -hmm. or not? Because if you can't even sneak in a 15-minute break during your day for you, what are you going to do if the water pipes burst at your house or if somebody in your family is, is ill or something else comes up where your personal and professional worlds come into conflict? Let me, I'll pause there for a second. (laughs) Well, I mean, it's just what you're you're bringing up for me. This concept of spaciousness in people's lives is really important. And that's what I'm hearing you say in terms of, you know, even if you can't create even just 15 minutes of spaciousness for yourself, you know, there's something to look at there. And because creating that spaciousness is what allows you to then become present and allows you to become more aware to what's happening. And then to be able to, like you're saying, tap into the somatic kind of signals that are happening in your body that really provide a ton of information. So that's what I'm cueing into. And then the other thing that I'm hearing you say, you use the word permission a lot. And I think that's a really interesting word. So um, yeah, wherever you want to take it next. I know you were kind of going to cover a couple of different things there, but I'm just punctuating a few things that are coming up for me as I'm listening to you. Hi. Well, I appreciate your reflection about the word permission. I am guilty of using that word a lot. And it's because so many of our beliefs about what we are allowed to do, what we are capable of doing, what's possible for us, can stem back to some sort of deeply held belief of that someone needs to to grant you the right to do it. Mm. That someone needs to, a fairy godmother needs to pop in and bibbity bobbity boop you and say, yes, you are allowed to do this. You are allowed to to try this. You are allowed. And so I think that reckoning with the concept of permission in your own psyche can be a really worthwhile thought exercise to see where might I be artificially limiting myself because of thoughts and beliefs that don't have anything to do with actual data points or actual feedback points that I have received from the external environment. Mm. So we can go down the permission path here in a second, but I want (laughs) to talk about the the active resistance, the the conscious resistance piece of this. Yes. So I will preface this by saying I am not a clinical psychotherapist. However, I have a background in psychology. And when resistance is coming up, I find it really helpful to draw some concepts from the world of the internal family systems, psychotherapeutic world. What the IFS world says is that when we have a an emotion that comes up strongly that is sort of trying to stop us from doing something. We think about that emotion as a protector. 
And resistance is usually anger or frustration or something very intense that is meant to protect and stop us from going down a path. And usually behind the the intensity is usually fear and a real worry and concern about an outcome that might come from pursuing this path. So when you start to think about resistance as your psyche's way of trying to protect itself, shelter and shield itself, it brings up an interesting set of questions. And those questions are, what am I most afraid of that's going to happen? What am I afraid of will be the product of giving myself permission to recalibrate this inner GPS? What am I afraid will happen if I start paying more attention to both the heck no and the heck yes bodily data points that I'm getting on a daily basis? Because you might find that those fears are are what a, a friend of mine terms as sort of pulling the fire alarm fears, where there's no fire but there's there's an alarm going off there's a fear there's nervousness there is a a signal that is being sent but there's no fire and if you notice that when you dig into your fears there are fears about things that aren't necessarily grounded in your current lived reality you know they might be from previous experiences that you've had they might be from childhood they might be from something that somebody told you in a different context that your brain has sort of crossed wires and is applying here Being willing to dig in and notice that and get curious about that can be all you need to find some spaciousness, Kathy, to borrow your word, and some room to groove to try to take some steps forward and keep making progress. But there's the the pulling the fire alarm type of anxieties and fears that can come up to try to protect you. But then there are legitimately the anxieties and fears around there being an actual fire. Right. So this might be if you are in a a situation where you're feeling really vulnerable. Um, Maybe you are in a situation where you're in a, a toxic workplace and there is some risk to being able to maintain your job or maintain employment if you speak out and say something. Uh, So you numb out and you try to ignore all of your feelings because if you notice how you're feeling on a somatic level, it's going to prompt you to want to do something that feels too risky and too scary to do. And if that's the truth for you, if you dig in and there is fire and the resistance is coming to try to keep you safe from the real fire, then often there's a step back in the work that you might be needing. You know, I almost think about this on a, a Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of way, that the self-actualization in your work is important for sure. We want to get you there. But if you have survival and safety needs that need to be addressed first, let's start there. Let's talk about making sure you've got a financial runway and a financial safety net to take care of you. Let's make sure that you've got risk management plans in place. Let's make sure that you have people who are on your side if it is a toxic work environment and people who can help you to document what's happening. So sometimes the resistance is actually a really helpful, important thing for us to listen to because it's telling us about a fire and trying to keep us safe from something that is a real threat. And sometimes it's just pulling the fire alarm. And it is not necessarily relevant or can be managed around very easily to allow you to move forward in a way that feels safe. And, you know, there's probably inherent risk to exploring any kind of transition or change, but where those risks feel fairly minimized and controlled. Yeah, there's so much really important wisdom on what you just shared. And I love the distinction between really pausing to understand your own resistance and what it might be telling you. And that's what I'm hearing you talk about too, in terms of unpacking that. And then I also really appreciate, and this is one of the things I'll get to a little bit later, but that I really love about your book too, is that it doesn't just put on rose colored glasses about like, Hey, we're all going to live in this state of full fulfillment around our work all the time. And, you know, in that, 
there are some practical things we need to take care of for ourselves. And so I appreciate that you brought that into the con- this context of this conversation as well. I, I, wa- I wonder too, part of what you're describing in terms of these fire alarms going off, I can only imagine in the last nine plus months for people living through this pandemic and a lot of people are questioning their work and wondering, you know, is this worth it? And they are seeking more fulfillment. They want more ease. You know, you hear all these data points coming out now, especially for women where they are needing to, you know, they're really having to leave the workforce. And I'm curious what you have been hearing from your clients or others, just being in this world of career fulfillment, finding career clarity, what you've been hearing over the last year. And if there's anything important for people who are kind of in this state right now to kind of think about given the current environment. Kathy, I'm so glad that you're bringing this up because it's really important it has a lot of relevance to the fire alarm versus fire analogy that we just talked about. And I have a lot to say on this. So let me start with that. The last year has sucked, right? Like let's not sugarcoat it. It has sucked for everyone. Everyone has suffered. There are different ways in which some of us have suffered that others have not. There are different levels of extremes, but it, it's, been, it's been rough. What the data about the last year says that feels really discouraging is that four times as many women have left the workforce than men. Three times as many women have left the workforce for child-related reasons to take care of kids. Uh, People are calling this a a she-session instead of a recession. And that the industries that have been hit by the recession are super lopsided. It is not like every single industry was hit equally. Uh, not every single industry has has faltered from this. I mean, goodness, look at places like Amazon where they have hired or are planning to hire over 100,000 new employees. So when you look at the industries that have been hit, you look at hospitality, you look at travel, you look at live events and the arts, it can feel incredibly discouraging. However, the places that have been hit and the people who have suffered are not the whole story. And this isn't meant to minimize the experience that anybody has been through, but it is is meant to offer up some hopefulness and some optimism about places to look and where to be searching if you're finding yourself in a, a position where you're dissatisfied. Because in Harvard Business Review, back in 2018, (laughs) before any of this happened, they did a longitudinal study on economic recessions. And they did this study around publicly traded companies. So they looked at recessions in the 80s, 90s, and then all the way up to the 2008. And what they saw was that among publicly traded companies, 17% of companies uh, fare poorly (laughs) in recessions. They are not prepared. They do not have contingency or continuity planning in place. They just get kicked in the face. However, in every single one of those recessions, in the economic analysis, 9% or more of publicly traded companies that existed at that time didn't just stabilize, right? didn't just stay at homeostasis through the recession. They actually grew. So the question for all of us is to try to find where that 9% is right now. Where is their growth? Where is their opportunity? Where is their potential in the marketplace right now? And if you look, you can find it. There are absolutely still folks hiring. And again, when you look at the, the data, if you look at the broad statistics, they don't tell a good story. They say things like professional services are are in a a complete standstill because nobody's quitting jobs and nobody is hiring. But if you dig deeper 
into the data and you look at specific areas, specific niche parts of sectors or industries, you see tons, tons more movement. Tech companies are having a heyday right now, right? If you look at the overarching data, it says that the construction industry is booming. But when you dig into it, it's only actually the residential piece that is booming and growing like wildfire. If you look at commercial or retail, those have practically stalled out. So the encouragement that I have for anybody who is unhappy in their job, they don't feel like their employer treated them well through COVID or protected them or had their happiness and health and safety front of mind, but who's also thinking to themselves, I just need to white knuckle it through because I'm lucky to have a job. There's so much unemployment. There's so many people who are suffering. What I want for those people to hear is that there is absolutely still optimism and opportunity out there. There are absolutely still companies that are hiring right now that could use someone like you who may be doing a much better job in protecting and honoring their employees right now. It may be in a sector or an industry that you didn't necessarily have strong aspirations to go into, but being willing to be responsive to the marketplace and to be open to try something new might give you an opportunity to grow into a place where you might be so much more respected, protected, or appropriately compensated than where you are now. Hanging on to wherever you are into perpetuity out of fear certainly never feels good. So give yourself permission to start the mechanics of looking at what else might be out there. And those mechanics being start tapping into your network and chatting up folks who you haven't been in touch with in a while about what's out there and what's next and how happy they are in their roles. Start thinking about brushing off your resume and getting ready to be sharing that professional profile of your past experiences with others to get feedback. It, there are things about the economy right now that don't feel normal, that don't feel stable, that don't feel good, but they're all surmountable issues. And I'll say too, Kathy, that when it comes to the execution of a job search right now, I have a team of five coaches that works with me at Career Clarity. And I've been serving everybody probably once every other month or so to say, okay, hey, what are you seeing that's working? What are the trends that your, your clients are facing? And nobody is seeing across the board changes. Some people are saying that hiring is slower. Some people are saying there are more rounds of interviews than they're used to. Other people are saying hiring is going faster because candidates are getting a lot more or organizations are getting a lot more candidates so that they can make a decision much more quickly. So be careful about the the information that you're consuming about what the job market is looking like. Because if you are consuming all of the news stories about it being doom and gloom, it's going to be easy to find data points that back that up. Look for the positive, look for the optimism, look for the growth, look for the openings and the job postings and people who are currently getting hired right now. And you'll find those too. And lean into those because they are going to be so much more helpful and life-giving for you. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And I think to remind people that it's great to hear and that you're hearing it from your coaches as well, that the job market is active. You know, like you're saying, there are certain, yes, there's been shifts and impacts. And I don't want to minimize just like you that people are struggling during this time, but there is opportunity out there as well. So I think stepping into that hopefulness is a really um, I would love, I, I really love leaving people with that and to kind of, yes, you might have to pivot or shift your focus areas or where you might want to look. But I'm also hearing it comes back to that permission thing again, which is give yourself permission to um, think that there's something more out there for you. And so, you know, you in the book talk about how you can fall into this trap of just being grateful for what you have instead of kind of stretching for more. And to shift a little bit, but along these lines, you talk about in career clarity, like when you start to look for something new, you know, thinking about both success on your terms as well as fulfillment. But I'd love to start with the success piece because I, I wholly agree with this that, you know, especially from my perspective, from a sustainable ambition perspective, 
it is not going to be sustainable if you are following somebody else's path, if you're settling and kind of just saying, I should just be grateful for what I have, um, really getting clear on, well, what is success on your terms? And honoring that seems really important to me. For you, what does defining success on your terms mean? Mm, What a great question. So defining success on your own terms means not that you don't look externally. It doesn't mean that you don't explore what else is going on, what other people have been doing, who's gotten promoted, who's gotten hired, where are their opportunities. But it's taking in all of those external data points and running them through a filter of how much does this matter to me being able to be the person that I want to be and live a life that feels authentic to my values. And so defining success on your own terms starts with first defining what your values are. And it's then through the lens of those values, evaluating different options and different possibilities to see which ones feel most life-giving and most aligned for you. One of the really interesting things that I've learned through doing this work is that there are some principles of, of success and fulfillment in our work that feel pretty universal, that everybody that I have ever spoken with wants to help people. Right? They want their work to be meaningful and be impactful in some way. But how you define helping people is a wildly personal and important thing to sit with. I'll give you the example of my little sister, which I mean, I suppose when we're adults, little sister feels like such a silly thing to say. My younger sister, uh, she has spent the majority of her adult life living and working in Japan. And she holds really high values around cross-cultural competency, around global diplomacy, around understanding other people. And that's how she defines helping. She defines helping as teaching and creating a cultural bridge. For me, that's a way of helping, but that doesn't feel as resonant to me personally. I don't want to yuck her yum. (laughs) I think that that's a wonderful way of helping people for her that is a manifestation of her values. And it's how she defines find success for herself. But for me, it looks and feels different. And so understanding yourself on a deep, intimate, personal level about what you value most, what you care about, what you care about that other people might not care about, those kinds of distinctions are so important to being able to make empowered career decisions that allow your path to feel really authentic and not just feel like you're you're trying to follow a model or follow the rubric that's set out for you by your employer or follow exactly what your mom did or follow you know the cultural norms around you need to be getting promoted every 2 to 3 years and this is the next title you should go to and this is the next rung and this is when you should have a corner office you know for some of us corner office is not in our personal definition of success for some of us, being able to be present and have flexibility to be with our with our kids, or if you're a caregiver for a family member, being able to be present for them. Uh, defining success on your own terms might mean that you get to live abroad, and that's a huge value for you. That won't be true for everyone. And recognizing how you are different and unique and a, a beautiful creature in that way is then critically important to being able to define success in a way that it helps you to make decisions that are going to feel good. Yeah, I think this is so important. And one of the things you started with too is this idea that for so many of us, and I find this when I talk with a lot of people, is that we're able to describe what we want in very generic terms. But what you're talking about is really getting to know yourself deeply and to get past these kind of surface level ways of being able to describe things. And I think it relates also to oftentimes I find that people when they're looking for work, you know, hey, I want to make a career transition or a shift, and they jump immediately to starting to look for the job. 
And there's a lot of work to do, um, you know, talk about career clarity and like making sure like that next step is going to be something that feels really powerful for you. It, there's a lot of work to get in tune with yourself. And I wonder, do you have any suggestions for people to like get that layer deeper? You know, when it's the, yes, I'd like to help people. I want meaningful work. I also find this with so many of us. It's not just millennials, folks. Like most of us, as you described, want to have meaningful work. It's it, We want to help people or we want to have an impact in some way. But I love how you're saying we really need to unpack that a little bit more so that we find those things that are really attuned to us. Well, the first step that I would encourage folks to take is to ask yourself the question of what does blank quality mean to me? So what does meaningful work mean to me? What does problem solving mean to me? And that can be a good jumping in point to start to define that for yourself. But the next thing to do is to bounce your definition off of somebody else and say, based on what I've described, what kind of job opportunities would you recommend for me? Because if you hear somebody then reflecting back to you of, okay, so you say that um, helping people is making a meaningful difference in their lives and supporting them through hard times. Okay, well then the kind of careers that sound like they might go along with that are maybe a social worker or maybe a, a pastoral counselor, maybe a nurse. If you hear somebody reflect that back to you and you realize, oh no, <laughs> that is not what I want to do, then you know you've got another layer further, another layer deeper to go with, okay, so when I talk about supporting people through hard times, actually, I'm thinking about being able to provide support to guide people through the legal system when they're facing eviction or when they're facing you know, such and such. And all of a sudden, you get to that moment of clarity. Oftentimes, one of the biggest uh, factors that prevents us from feeling like we have clarity is that generalization the sort of vagueness of amorphous concepts that we haven't yet taken the time to distill down to the granular definitions for ourselves. So keep pressing yourself and pushing yourself and use external sounding boards to help you see if you're going in a direction that feels authentic. Because if you hear people say job ideas that give you those same heck no somatic feelings, the withdrawal, the feeling like you can't breathe as deeply. Those are really important to pay attention to. So I really love that, Lisa, what you just shared in terms of both going deeper and unpacking. And then you also talk about trying things on in your book. And I believe this too, that you really need to prototype things and try them on. And I think what you're describing in terms of people go, you know, you might think you have it figured out, but go try it on with people and get some advice and then see and listen for that feedback again, your somatic kind of responses to give you additional information to really guide you. So that sounds really powerful to me. And, you know, it's an understanding too, that it's this iterative kind of process. You know, one of the things that comes up for me when it, in this work is that, um, and see, I'm calling it work because I think that sometimes people just assume that, oh, shouldn't our work or career kind of be wired in us? It's almost like I think they think about it as our personality and that that's tied directly to this one, you know, career path for us. And I think oftentimes, you know, you say in the book, remember that this career clarifying work is worth it. And I don't know if you intended this, but I kind of cued in on the work part of it <laughs> because there is some work to this. And, you know, what I'm hearing you say is doing this work of kind of going deeper to unpack what's important to you, doing the work to go and try that out with folks to get some additional feedback to then get more clarity. Again, that career clarity to like help you move forward. It's worth it. The payoff is worth it. So, I just don't know if, if you have any reaction to that, just this sense of it is an iterative process and there's a bit of work you have to put in to kind of find that clarity. Well, Kathy, bringing back our concept of permission here, 
when it comes to exploring what could be next in your career or in your life, oftentimes we have a belief that that you should just have some sort of divine sense of knowing, you know, exactly like you were talking about, that it should be ingrained in your wiring. You just need to figure it out. You just need to have it magically pop forward. And what I will say is that there's maybe 5% of the population for whom that is true that they just instinctively, intuitively know where to go, what to do, what's next. And there's a certain portion of the population that is really contented with getting into their one track or their one swim lane, if you will, and just hanging out there for the entirety of their career. You know, these are the folks who do 40 years in dentistry and then, you know, retire and, and sell their practice. But what I tend to find is that for the vast majority of us, we love learning and growth. And one of the tricky things is that when you love learning and growth, you are constantly consuming new information and finding out things you didn't know before and discovering depth or discovering breadth in a topic area that you didn't know was available. And how difficult would that be in our lives if we had to be limited to only what we already know to think about the sorts of career decisions and questions and pivots that could be life-giving to us through the course of our career? So in some ways, it's really important to give yourself permission to evolve and allow yourself to outgrow things. And this is especially true for for smarty pants people, right? Overachievers, high performers, people who got a lot of A's in school or might have even been in honors programs and things like that. Like you are excellent learners and you're probably very motivated by it. And you are more likely to outgrow a job or an industry or a function faster than some of your peers. And rather than looking at that and and shaming and blaming yourself about it of like, oh, why can't I just be happy? Why can't I just be satisfied? Why can't this just be enough? To give yourself the grace and the spaciousness and the permission to think, huh, maybe it's time for my next evolution. I wonder what would be the most life-giving for me to lean into next or to learn next or to master next can take something that can feel really confronting and scary and turn it into a beautiful invitation and opportunity to lean into doing something that you love with being stretched and being challenged. I think this is such an important note. It's what, to me, one of the core things about sustainable ambition is this, you know, the second pillar I talk about is right aspiration, which tunes into this idea that our satisfaction and our ambitions often for most of us (laughs) ebb and flow over time. And just as you're saying, and I love how you pull this forward, this idea that, you know, many of us love growth and learning and you need to give, again, that permission word, that openness for you to learn along the way, to recognize that you might want the next growth chapter and to take that on and that it allows you more freedom to just accept that you're going to, you know, kind of have a journey around your career as opposed to finding it's because there's so much pressure we all put on ourselves, you know, around finding that one path. And I feel like a lot of people end up in this space of shame when they get to like a mid-career point or they're even just 10 to 15 years in and they start to say, you know, I haven't figured it out yet. You know, I haven't landed. And Personally, I kind of feel like, well, there may not be a landing and that we need to accept that this is it's a little bit more, like you say, an acceptance of evolution. So, and I'd love to, I love what you're sharing because I, I really would like to normalize this a little bit because I just don't think it's talked about enough in our society, especially around career management. I completely agree, Kathy. And I think that... Uh, Some of the reasons for that are really understandable, that previous generations to ours didn't have the internet. 
They didn't have the ability for information to be so free flowing and for you to have so many more choices and options in your life. The way that the economy and the marketplace functioned were based around things like pensions, where it was important to stay in one place and do the same thing for 40 years. Otherwise, you didn't get access to this safety net. So because the world and the marketplace have evolved so dramatically over the last 30, 40 years, it makes sense that we would have some previous beliefs about career pathing, ambition, figuring things out, you know, what a successful fruitful career is that we would need to, to shed and that we would need to create afresh for this time and this world. You know, Jenny Blake, who we both love and admire, says, you know, if change is the only constant in our world, let's get better at it. And I think that giving yourself permission to change and to evolve and to be a constant work of art that you're refining and polishing and adding to over the arc of your career and your life is a really empowering, beautiful way to think about career ambition in a way that can feel sustainable. Yeah. I love that as a closing note before I ask just a final piece of advice, because I think I could talk to you a lot longer, Lisa, and ask you a lot more questions. Um, But this has been such a fabulous and I think hopeful conversation, a really empowering conversation for people to walk away with, like, believe there's opportunity out there for you, believe that you have permission to land in something that's going to be really fulfilling for you. And it starts with giving yourself that permission as well to start to tap into your own knowing and to honor that. So with that, I love to just ask and close with what's a final piece of advice you'd love to leave our listeners with? Well, since we've already mentioned Jenny Blake, I'll bring her up one more time because she has a a phrase that she uses when she trains people that I think is beautiful. And that phrase is safe to try. When it comes to thinking about what could be next in your career, in your life, in your relationship, in your health, in your whatever, when we think about our ambition and our aspirations, Sometimes it can feel like those dreams and hopes are so big and so far away that they, they'll they never happen or that they are just out of reach. And when you ask yourself what might be safe to try, sometimes it is remarkable how many ideas can come to mind of easy, quick, low-risk baby steps that you can take to Just put yourself one inch closer to that goal. Maybe it is sending one networking email. Maybe it is looking up one podcast for somebody who works in the industry you want to get into. Maybe it is taking one free 45-minute class on an online learning platform about an area that you want to gain some skills. The things that are safe to try and building up a a snowball of momentum uh, it starts from that space of tiny steps and safe to try and gains its own life and its own energy from consistent, persistent action. So if you're listening to this episode of the podcast and you have been craving a change, but you're feeling overwhelmed with where to start, ask yourself what might be safe to try to figure out even just one baby step that will start to make a meaningful difference in your level of commitment and conviction and excitement around making that transition actually happen. I love that, Lisa. And I love the encouragement for people to get into action because that's where that um, energy will be found and where they will start to find momentum. And it's in these small, safe to try moments So I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Well, it's been wonderful to talk with you. And I'd love to just um, make make sure to let people know where they can find you. So how can people keep in touch with you? Well, Kathy, it has been an honor and a pleasure to be here. And if anything that I've been saying has been resonating with anybody listening, you can find me at getcareerclarity.com. And you can pick up a free preview copy of the beginning of my book, 
at getcareerclarity.com slash book. Perfect. And I will capture that as well in the show notes. And I highly recommend the book. It's um, super insightful and helpful. And Lisa has a lot of great actionable steps within the book to guide you through. Um, And again, you can find her at getcareerclarity.com. So thank you again, Lisa. I've really loved the conversation and so appreciate you sharing your wisdom with our listeners. Thank you, Kathy. It's an honor to be here. Find more inspiring interviews and get show notes for this episode at sustainableambition.com slash podcast. Make sure you don't miss an episode or my insider tips, guides, and tools by signing up for Sustainable Ambition Forum, my twice monthly newsletter. Sign up at sustainableambition.com slash subscribe. Thanks again for joining me. Speak with you next time.